Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about polycystic kidney disease. This is um, something that you do run into uh, fairly frequently on your exam. And one of the big reasons that you run into it is that this is a big cause of secondary hypertension. Now, secondary hypertension is hypertension that usually presents in a young person. So this needs to be on your differential when you have somebody maybe 28 years old comes in from the health fair, says I had a weird high blood pressure reading, and then you confirm it. And now you need to figure out why that is. And this is one of the things that is going to be on your differential. In a future video, I will talk more about secondary hypertension. It's a very important um, workup uh, that you would do in that case. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, so PKD is a group of disorders, but there's really only two of them that are relevant for you, and that would be ADPKD, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, and naturally autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. Now, let's just go into what these have in common first. So first of all, they're both diagnosed on ultrasound. Um, now, you may do other imaging modalities, but you should always start with an ultrasound. Um, they both involve hereditary renal cysts, and these renal cysts develop over time. So if you have a person coming in and you've diagnosed them, they have four cysts now, 20 years down the road, they may have, they may have 15 cysts. So these develop gradually, particularly when we talk about autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Uh, hypertension is a common feature in both. Um, now, again, this is something that often develops over time as you begin to lose renal function, um, but that is something that will happen as well. And they both ultimately will result in end-stage renal disease. The treatment for both is focused on the complications. All right, so let's first start with ADPKD. ADPKD patients, we used to call this adult polycystic kidney disease. That's not a good term because many of these patients do present before adulthood, um, but it does present in childhood or adulthood, and that is very different from the other one that we're going to talk about. Presenting features, you know, it really just depends on the patient. They may have one, they may have all, they may have none. Uh, but early onset hypertension is a big one. Um, again, because it's so easy to identify. Uh, if a patient comes in for no other reason, they're asymptomatic, and you've got a 16-year-old and they're running a blood pressure of 140 over 90, um, you definitely need to think of the, there is something going on, and the kidney is one of the first places you want to look. Um, gross hematuria in 40% of patients, so that would be somebody coming in saying, oh, doc, my pee is orange. Um, you need to immediately get a urinalysis in that case. Polyuria can happen. We often associate that with diabetes. This is a mild polyuria, and the idea here is that with polycystic kidney disease, there is difficulty with concentrating the urine. Remember, these cysts begin in the nephron unit, and they balloon out. So if you... Um, are having issues in the nephron unit, um, you're gonna have a hard time concentrating urine. Furthermore, there is uh, some thought that uh, this whole pathologic process uh, involves vasopressin uh, and some abnormalities with signaling. Um, so we'll, we will get to that in a little bit. So early onset hypertension, gross hematuria, mild episodic flank pain. Don't confuse that with nephrolithiasis. This is fairly mild. Uh, these patients will not um, say this is the worst back pain I've ever had in my life. Um, and it doesn't radiate to the groin because it's, doesn't, it does not involve the ureters. All right, uh, so an affected parent is common, uh, which is typical for any autosomal dominant disorder. A uh, physical exam is going to be based on the uh, symptomatology, but hypertension or borderline hypertension is not uncommon. About a, a quarter to half of children and over half of adults with ADPKD will have hypertension. They may have edema if there is enough renal decline to where you're losing enough protein um, that can cause edema. 
Uh, if you suspect ADPKD, as you always should, if you have a young person with hypertension and abnormal renal function tests, abnormal urinalysis, those two should always be ordered, um, then you want to get a renal ultrasound. That is the best initial diagnostic uh, step. And you can see here, there is this criteria for uh, diagnosing ADPKD on ultrasound. Uh, you do not need to memorize this, but just note here how the older you get, the more cysts you have to have to satisfy the criteria, and that's because you develop more and more cysts with time. Now, the management is mostly symptomatic, but remember when I said that there is some involvement of vasopressin? Um, well, we have a drug that slows that down, and thus it slows the progression of this disease. And that drug is tolvaptan. It is a, an inhibitor of vasopressin. And so we use this to slow the decline of, uh, of ADPKD, slow renal decline in ADPKD. Um, and so the idea is just that vasopressin uh, will stimulate the development of more and more and more cysts. And so if we can slow that, we can slow renal decline. Now remember that renal volume increases basically at the same rate that uh, that your renal function decreases. So we could we could call this um, creatinine clearance or GFR or something. Okay, so as, as, renal, as renal volume goes up, your GFR is going to go down. Uh, this is all basically a mass effect uh, that's, that's behind all of this. Um, all right, now remember that intracranial aneurysm is a major complication here. Um, the question is, do we screen patients? And the answer to that is, in most cases, no. If you have a patient who does have a family member with a documented intracranial aneurysm or a subarachnoid hemorrhage, then you should screen the patient, um, but routine screening is not recommended. Um, other people that you may uh, screen is, let's say that your patient's an airline pilot, then it's probably a good idea to screen them because of you know the, the risks that they would otherwise be taking. And certainly if they have any kind of CNS symptom, you should consider uh, screening them uh, in that case. ARPKD is usually noted on prenatal ultrasound, so this will not be a surprise when this patient is born. Uh, it's about one in 20,000 births, so if you do your math there, you've got a carrier frequency of uh, about one in 70. Uh, oligohydramnios is really behind all of the phenotypic things that we see the, with the Potter sequence. Um, so I'll show you a picture of that, but remember that the kidneys are responsible for making urine, and of course, what is uh, the, the fluid in the uterus? It is baby pee, okay? That's what it is. Um, so uh, they have a low amount of amniotic fluid. It causes fetal compression, abnormal facial appearance, and, uh, and uh, limb distortions. And remember that amniotic fluid helps the lungs develop. So if there's not sufficient amniotic fluid, you're going to have a pulmonary hypoplasia, and that is behind the cause of death in many of these babies. About 30% don't survive infancy, 20% will die from respiratory distress, 20 to 45% of neonatal survivors will develop end stage renal disease by age 20. So this is not a great prognosis. Um, you can see already the difference in severity compared to ADPKD. Labs, uh, imaging is the most important, and then uh, to diagnosis, it's going to be really apparent, but genetic testing is available. The management, again, here is uh, symptomatic. There is no role for tolvaptan here, so otherwise the management is pretty much the same. This is Potter's facies, uh, so this is something you want to know. Potter's syndrome is not only seen in uh, ARPKD, so you'll want to know what this looks like. Look for the widely set eyes, kind of hard to see here. This characteristic beaked shaped nose, you can really see it there. Um, they tend to have a prominent inner canthus. Again, you can't really see it here. I'm sorry about that. Um, very low lying, abnormally placed ears, very obvious in this child. And then they can have limb contractures and certainly pulmonary hypoplasia is a really, really, really important manifestation here. This is polycystic kidney disease on uh, CT. So you can see here multiple cysts bilaterally, and you can even see some cysts in the liver parenchyma. 
Now, just regular old renal cysts are very common. About half of adults over age 50 have at least one renal cyst. They're pretty much always asymptomatic. They're found incidentally, usually on a CT. Um, they may cause hematuria or flank pain. So if you have a patient who comes in with mild flank pain, they're older, you work them up for everything else and it's negative, um, but you get a urinalysis and there's a little bit of blood in the urine, that's probably what you're dealing with. However, anytime you have a patient with blood in the urine that you cannot explain, you need to visualize the kidneys. So your next best step is to get a renal ultrasound and then we're looking at the wall and the debris inside. So if you have a nice smooth wall and a homogenous looking smooth appearing uh, inside of the cyst, then what you're dealing with is more than likely something benign. So that would be this right here or this right here. You can see a very nice, well-defined wall and a homogenous inner appearance. Now compare that to this. Um, so here you see an ultrasound. Um, and you can see the wall is kind of hazy a little bit, especially over here um, on your right as you view it. And you can see the debris is very heterogeneous. So what do we worry about here? Renal cell carcinoma. And so you can see another one here. And here.